This is the last session of RPA Live. Um, so I hope everyone enjoyed the, uh, the previous sessions. Um, and uh, there will be a, um, a recording in the session and a white paper that will go out to um, all actually 1,300 registrants that have been to this week. So um, that's uh, great news. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed those sessions. I hear very good things, um, particularly about the Appian, Hexaway, and WorkFusion um, sessions that took place uh, earlier this week. Um, in fact, it's come to mind that, that anyone with, uh, with children will probably have seen Ice Age. Uh, I will remember the, the dodos with the, um, with the, when they were talking about the last melon. Um, that's how it feels like to do the final session uh, of the week. Um, but it's also a good description of the, uh, the topic that we're going to be discussing life in a, uh, in a post-outsourcing world. Um, important note for everyone, I do not want you all out there to be passively listening. I want activity. I want this to be a two-way communication. Um, so I want questions and I want disagreement. If, uh, if you disagree with what I'm saying, then, uh, then please do let me know. Um, so don't wait, and wait until they ask uh, the end to ask questions. Uh, use the Q&A box thing uh, down at the, uh, the bottom. Uh, and ask things as they can. And I'll actually answer them um, as we go through the uh, through the presentation. So let's uh, let's start. Um, so my name is Guy Kirkwood. I, I work with the UiPath um, originally as a COO and uh, now as chief evangelist of the organisation. Um, and we'll we'll come to a bit more about that in in detail uh, later. So in terms of the topic today, I mean there's been any number of articles and thought leadership pieces in the press about who are also going to take, make a, a significant percentage of global workers unemployed as work becomes increasingly aut automated. This is balderdash and bunker. There is, however, one group of workers which are now being impacted in their tens of thousands. These are the employees and contractors of the outsourcing service providers. So the question is, if robotic process automation is the future, is automation ringing the death now for outsourcing. Bear in mind, there are now three and a half million people in India alone doing processing work, um, either in captive and shared service operations or indeed in outsourced operations. Um, at what used to be known as, uh, as your mess for less. These are the jobs that RPA is replacing. So, why now? Why you should be looking at uh, the side of life. So why now? RPA is crossing between inflated expectations and real world productivity. It's moving from the innovators in um, and the uh, from the innovators and the early adopters to early mainstream customers. This means that the window for first mover advantage in any particular industry including yours, as you're listening, is closing. So as Michael Lim of IBM said at a recent conference at which I was presenting, RPA is not about the technology. It's about the outcomes. And indeed, this has been demonstrated by Alex Balbonton of um, Credit Suisse, who proved to his board the value of RPA in just nine months. So in terms of growth, what you're seeing there is 140% compound annual growth rate. Um, now, in fact, I've cheated. That 100%, 140 percent uh, compound annual growth rate isn't actually anything to do with RPA. Um, it's actually the growth of steam power between 1800 and 1815. So rapid technological change driving growth is nothing new. In fact, I believe we're at the start of the fourth industrial revolution. Um, the first started in 1865 when James Hargreaves invented the spinning jenny. And it did better than RPA actually, it actually did the work of eight people. Um, RPA generally does the work of between three and five people. And this did the work of eight people. Uh, and the first industrial revolution culminated in the rise of steam power, as I mentioned. Um, so, in fact, Sarah Burnett, who is the uh, lead Everest analyst on, um, 
RPA. Um, recently predicted that, that the growth rate for RPA in the next four years is actually 90%, so almost doubling every year. So it's exponential growth. So go back to the Industrial Revolution. The second Industrial Revolution was characterized by mechanization and epitomized by Henry Ford, who opened his first assembly line in 1913. And, and generally accepted the third Industrial Revolution started in 1972, when Intel produced the first 8-bit processor which heralded the dawn of the digital era in which we now live. So to put RPA growth in perspective, last year within UiPath, we grew by 400% in terms of our annual recurring revenue. Uh, and we've already doubled that in the first five months of this year. So uh, I know that Blue Prism uh, just released their, uh, their uh, first year, uh, their, their um, results for the first call, um, half, and actually they've doubled as well. So. Um, it's not just us, it's Blue and Alteration anyway, and, and, and UI path are all growing very, very fast. The question is why? Um, and I think a lot of it is based on real world productivity. So RPA growth is really driven by, by technology, <coughs> by technology innovators in virtualization, in cloud, mobile, analytics, and robotic vision. It's driven by a maturity in services by business process outsourcing organizations, um, by shared service leaders, process optimizations and re-engineering like Lean and Six Sigma, uh, global process owners, global business service units. You see RPA as the next logical step in their evolution. <coughs> uh, and finally, there's a change in mentality. Moving from a purist mindset of we need to automate end-to-end -to, -end, to it's good enough, as even partial automation yields high ROI and improved performance. In fact, if you wind back to when RPA first started, 2002, 2003, when, when Blue Prism actually created the market, um, then it was all about technology um, and systems being able to automate end-to-end. -end. In the same way that um, ERP started 15 years ago with the idea of doing straight through processing. Now, we know that that hasn't become a reality, at least for the majority of organizations. If you think about it, there are 1,800 shared service operations just in Europe alone. And 80% of those do not have a single instance of ERP. So those organizations still have people manually transferring information through and between systems. And that's really driving the increase in growth in RPA. Because robots can just do it. And as an example, Mitchell Crawford of uh, Society Generale, SOCGEN, has said that the partnership between operational excellence and RPA is having a dramatic positive impact across the whole bank. So how big is it so far? Um, if you take uh, this, 5%, um, that's the figure that Cathy Tornborn of Gartner, uh, the lead analyst in, in this space uh, for Gartner, um, has estimated the global market penetration for RPA is currently sitting at 5%. That's for enterprises with revenues in excess of a billion dollars. So far, it's grown bottom up. So in other words, someone sitting in a shared service or uh, an operational part of the business um, is frankly sick to death of doing their job, and manually transferring information through in between systems, doing this, this, what's been described as taking the robot out of the person. Um, and so they've downloaded a copy of the software, they've done some tutorials online, they've tried it out, and they've actually automated something. They've gone to their boss and said, look what I managed to do. Then their boss in touch, you know, has gone in touch with us uh, and with our competitors, and, and we've demonstrated the value of RPA and what it's capable of. And, and that's gone to POC, to pilots, and, and now to scale in a lot of organizations. Actually, what we're seeing now is that the C-suites chief execs, CFOs, CLOs of organizations, of these same organizations, are now going to the strategic consulting partners, these are the EYs, the PWCs, the Deloitte's, the Accenture's, and so on, the KPMGs, and say, tell me about this robot stuff. What, what impact are they going to have on my business? Because I'm reading about it, because I'm seeing stuff about it. Now, it's likely that some of this activity might already be going on inside their organization, and they don't even know about it. But in any case, we, as the vendor, we don't need to own the relationship with the C-suite of our customers. That is the purview of the strategic consulting 
and implementation partners. And that's going to drive activity top down. So we're operating bottom up, that activity is going to be top down. And Kathy and I think that we will get to about 15 to 18 uh, percent adoption in the next 12 to 15 months. And if anyone that's read Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey Moore knows that that 15 to 18 percent is really important because that's when any new technology moves from the early adopters into mainstream. And that is when RPA and intelligence automation will become ubiquitous very, very quickly indeed. Um, so what matters? Actually, there are four things that matter when you're doing RPA. Um, breadth, in other words, how many processes can you automate? Velocity, how fast can you automate those processes? Agility, what happens when things change? Is, your, is the, the robotic platform capable of adapting to changes? I'll we'll come back to that in a bit. And security, which is just the table stakes. You have to be secure, otherwise no organization, corporate organization will, will reach you. Um, so those are the four things that matter. Um, so if that's the case, do I need help in order to get there? Um, and the answer is yes. Generally, yes. So at UiPop, we always, always recommend that our customers use a partner to help implement robotics. Think about it. RPA is easy to understand and it's easy to pilot, but it's not easy to implement at scale. Think of it as a project without an expiration date. You need to think ahead to be able to take advantage of the full potential that RPA can deliver throughout your organization. To implement it sustainably, you need to create a solid foundation. And what we're finding is that organizations that have started to use CLEs, Centers of Excellence, um, to actually inculcate robotics in their shared service operation early, are now looking to move that outside of the shared service operation across the broader business. Now that's really interesting, because if you look at the way that the outsourcing the shared service market started, or the offshore of the market started, it tended to be the internal operations of those organizations that became the BPA. So think about GE that spun off Jekyll that has become Genpact as a good example. Now what that means is that providing you are creating a robust platform from which to build, or foundation from which to build your, your automation program, you listening into this webinar could be the people that create your own effectively your own internal BPO organization that provides services to every part of your organization, every part of your business, more effectively and more economically than the alternatives. And part of that is obviously driving uh, a diminution of outsourcing as an alternative. And again, we'll come back to that. So in order to do that, you need to consider several things. You need to consider more than one technology. RPA is just a tool. It's Automation has been around for decades in terms of screen scraping and macros. But what we're doing now is that both for unattended activity, so back office operations, and attended, so front office operations, automation is becoming uh, much more usable, uh, a, a much more economic way of doing it rather than using people. Um, you need to integrate those siloed operations though, and you need application and data uh, to be adapted and scalable. So a tripartite relationship between the software vendor, regardless of whether you use us or automation or Blue Prism, um, the customer, that's you, and the implementation partner allows customers to dramatically reduce their time to value. That's, you know, it, it just takes you a shorter amount of time. Um, in fact, uh, we just got a question in from uh, Frank Harper. Um, Frank's asked, um, the breadth, velocity, agility, and security, what's that referring to? Um, Frank, it's, it's really around how you would, how you judge whether automation is going to be appropriate and which technology you decide to use. So from a breadth perspective, if one technology can only automate a, a small number of processes, um, let's say within finance, month-end close and so on, then that's not going to be as effective as a uh, an RPA um, 
solution that can do finance and accounting and HR onboarding and uh, claims processing and uh, know your customer activities. So that's where the breadth comes in. The velocity is how fast can you actually automate. So that revolves around how much capability do you need within your organization to automate those processes? Is it no code? Is it is it low code? Is it do you need sort of world class techies to actually develop the, the robots? Um, that will dictate as to how fast you can do it. And also based on my comment about um, whether you the partner, because they will they will help you accelerate as well. Agility, um, that really comes down to um, what happens when things change. You know, if if you control the underlying applications, but the underlying applications become um, outdated and therefore replaced, will your automation platform be able to adapt to that? Um, one of the reasons, ironically, that BPOs, business process outsourcing companies, like you know, iPath so much, is because we operate as fast and seamlessly through Citrix as we do if we've got access to the underlying application. Now, for BPOs, in most cases, they don't have access to the underlying application. What they're seeing is a bitmap. Now, for humans, that's not a problem at all because intuitively we know where first name, last name, address, telephone number, whatever the data is, and it doesn't matter where it is on the screen or in, in, in what color it is or um, uh, how grainy the picture is, um, we will be able to see that. For automation, up until recently, that's been incredibly difficult. So as those fields change around the screen, then um, it, it breaks the robots. Um, for us, um, we use robotic vision. Now, uh, Daniel Dinat, our, our chief executive founder, spent five years at Microsoft as, a, as a, an engineer. In fact, he's got a couple of patents to his name, working on exactly this topic, working on exactly how you automate, how you get systems to see what's happening on the screen and they manipulate that. Um, and that's actually why um, our, our UI path is, is so successful in the, in the RPA market, uh, sorry, in the, in the BPA market. Um, and security. Security is, um, it, you need to be totally secure, it needs to be um, operate on a, uh, a back office operations as securely as it does on front office operations and so on. And we've got loads of data on, on, on that in terms of uh, the, the table stakes required to be secure. Um, okay, so let's let's go back. Uh, I hope that answers your, uh, answers your question. Um, from the um, what we want to move on next to is the um, basically the intelligent automation, intelligent execution. And before we do that, let's let's go to go to the, the real bug there. Um, I, this offshoring is dead thing. Um, I actually came up with this in uh, February. I was at a conference in uh, in uh, Orlando, in Florida, uh, and I put this up on the screen and, uh, and stood in front of it because uh, I was presenting, and uh, loads of people took photographs and it, and it spread virally quite quickly. Um, I should perhaps have put a question mark after that. Um, is offshoring dead, or offshoring is dead? Question mark. Um, I think that the if you look at NASCOM, which took place in February. Um, they were worried about the outsourcing service providers were worried about two things, um, Donald Trump uh, and the H-1B uh, visas, and also automation. Automation is radically transforming the way that organizations are buying and delivering services. That's both internally within shared service operations and also externally if they're using outsourcing service providers. Now, actually, the offshoring organizations have been using automation over the last three or four years. Um, but they haven't been telling their customers they're doing it. So uh, let me give you one example, I'll have to be vague. Um, as a motor manufacturer, uh, we automated a number of their processes uh, and reduced the headcount by, for those processes by 75%. Um, that didn't mean that they were made redundant, it's just that they then moved up the value chain. Uh, so 75% was a good result. Um, so we, as an organization, were out talking about it. We got a call from the outsourcing service provider saying, um, can you stop talking about this, please? And we said, why? It's a, it's a great case study. They said, yes, it's because we did it, but we didn't tell the customer. So that sort of behavior, as organizations become more educated, um, has, has stopped. It has to stop. Um, but more importantly, organizations are now looking at either bringing that work back in-house 
or bringing it to uh, into shared service operations and bringing those to near or onshore uh, locations, um, or indeed um, bringing it back onshore into an existing operation. So that that is a a big big difference in terms of the um, the operation, um, and uh, and we're starting to see that um, increasingly. That is not sure he's dead. Um, it's not dead yet, but I think that uh, unless the offshore organisations radically um, look at the way that they are delivering business and the way that they're selling business, then uh, it's not looking good. Um, in fact, um, there is a, I was on a conversation earlier this week with uh, Miriam DC. Um, she is Ovum's leading services analyst. And, and she reported that outsourcing contracts in 2017 particularly in the US, have, quote, fallen off a cliff. So organizations should look automating first before they consider um, offshore or outsourcing. Uh, is, is basically what the message is from this. So let's, uh, let's move on. Um, cognitive and AI and how that combines with, with RPA. Intelligent execution is what we're looking to do. And intelligent execution is because um, RPA is really good at dealing with structured data, and it's really good at dealing with rules-based stuff. But if you've got unstructured or semi-structured data, um, then it's actually, it doesn't work. Um, so by baking in or using some of these cognitive and AI engines, you can actually create intentional execution. And rules-based is, is a natural way of operating, whether like driving a car or preparing breakfast. So AI and cognitive abilities enable RPA to apply varying levels of what's known as heuristic problem solving. Combining the two into intelligence automation begins to close that human and robot gap. Um, and, and that's what you would have heard of in several of the sessions this, uh, over the last few days. And this is where UiPath sits. Um, so how clever is this, is this technology? Actually, um, AI is being democratized by the likes of Google and Microsoft and IBM. Your intelligence of these systems is currently sitting, I love this slide, it's, it, I, I stole it, I can't even remember who, who, who used it first, but um, um, it's the first time I've used this in a, in a presentation, but uh, the, it currently sits, I, intelligence, or, uh, intelligence, raw intelligence of systems, artificial intelligence, um, currently sitting between a mouse and a chimp. Um, the, as things accelerate, as you see on that graph, the time it takes to go from idiot, uh, and by the way, you can choose any climate change denier as an example, um, and genius is startling in thought. Um, and then it goes into that exponential curve. Um, and by the way, um, WTF uh, stands for what's the future, in, in case you're wondering. So how will this affect and impact RPA? Um, AI and cognitive will transform what matters most in RPA products. So if you think about the, the breadth, velocity, agility, and security issues uh, that I mentioned, um, Karen Pasco of MasterCard has estimated that the move from manual intelligence to artificial intelligence is still three to five years out. And that isn't actually what we're seeing. And to give you a few examples about what we're doing, um, which will give you an example. So um, Swiss Re, one of our big insurance clients, um, has IBM Watson on-premise. Um, IBM Watson's expensive enough on cloud, not alone on-premise, but it is actually on-premise at, uh, at, um, at Swiss Re, uh, working on closed processing. And IBM Watson's taking the unstructured data, turning it into structured data, and then um, it's feeding our robots, feeding UiPath robots. Um, we're working with Abby, that's A-B-B-Y-Y. Um, originally, they were an OCR uh, organization, but they have actually cracked the semi and unstructured data into structured data, particularly when it comes to invoicing. So if you think about, uh, you think about invoicing, um, invoices coming from your customers uh, and suppliers in masses of different formats. It's basically their formats. There's only one company in the world, actually, that is, um, mandates their own uh, invoicing format, and that's Walmart. Uh, but other than that, you know that you've got all this stuff coming in in multiple different formats. So what Abby can do 
is turn that semi-structured data, so we know it's an invoice, it's what the system knows it's an invoice, but it's pulling all the data out of the line items and so on, turn it into structured data, and then that feeds our robots. Why is that important? It means that you can automate more processes. It's as simple as that. So if, and it's basically what, what I would describe as the holy grail of RPA. Um, because if you can automate more processes, it means that you can be more efficient for your people. Other examples, uh, we're using Elasticsearch. Uh, it's an open source uh, product. Um, and that's actually baked today into our orchestrator, into our server product. Um, that means you can start to do predictive analytics. And as an example, um, we are helping banks and financial institutions meet their regulatory compliance requirements. So actually, this is, this is a good example of about the way that things are changing. So we, we originally went to the banks and said, we can help you increase the efficiency and decrease the cost of your operations. And they said, yeah, fine, come back in six months, come in, because we're, we're busy. Um, so we went to see the, uh, the SEC, uh, Securities uh, Equities Commission and FCA in the UK, which is the, the Financial and Conduct Authority. And we said, well, why are the banks not interested in this? They said, well, it's because we keep finding them, because they're not meeting their regulatory compliance. Um, but we worked out that actually, the way the robots work um, helps organizations um, with exactly the data that the, the regulators are requesting. So, in terms of know your customer, in terms of um, GDPR, which is coming up in May next year, um, AML, sort of uh, um, anti-money anti laundering, um, things like BCBS 239, whatever that is. You know, these type of activities that are required um, within a regulatory compliance um, structure are things that actually the robots produce by accident, essentially for free. So we completely changed the conversation. So we went to the banks then and said, do you know what, we can actually help you reach your regulatory requirements and by the way, we can increase the, uh, the efficiency and um, reduce the uh, cost of your operations. And uh, uh, as a was direct result of that, we've signed up five banks in the last two months um, just by changing that conversation. So that's using Elasticsearch for the uh, predictive analytics. Um, we also do things like working on self-learning rule engines. Um, so at the moment, uh, for anyone that's used the software, you can download a, a copy um, from our website. Um, use Studio. So Studio is, is, is uses recorders to record the steps that a that a user makes, and that becomes the robot. Um, so when you want to uh, when you want to change anything, so if the underlying application changes, as I mentioned, you want to change or a new business rule, uh, then you need to go back into Studio. So the human readable, uh, sorry, the self learning rule engine means that we will just load the software onto the users workstation or laptop um, and it will just watch instead of using recorders and studios and so on it will just watch what that person does and it will build the process itself um, so it will basically you end up with self-building robots without any recorders um, related to that we're also using um, what we termed as human readable process maps essentially what that means is we're building an app store we're using machine learning and natural language processing to stimulate the reuse of robot as our artifacts um, Think of it as an app store. So as someone develops a uh, an AP module, so a accounts payable module, or a, um, a uh, Salesforce login, or an SAP um, activity, that will go into a, into a repository on your systems, and you can reuse those, you reuse those across multiple business units within your organization. And in fact, if you allow it, they can actually be used external to your organization. And then we, we won't monetize that, UI Path won't monetize that, but we will monetize that for the developer who actually developed that. So that, that, I'll come back to community in a minute, but that really helps with, uh, with building a community of, uh, of people who want to make the product better. Um, and finally, chatbots. Everyone's talking about chatbots. So using chatbots in a natural language process in NLP, um, the, the human users can tell the robot what to do with business exceptions. Uh, and using machine learning, the robot will remember this for the next time. So going back to my uh, um, invoicing example, so uh, let's say an invoice comes in, the robot doesn't understand it, or flag it up to the human user. Um, at the moment, the user has to use Studio to, to give it a new business rule, but ultimately, uh, we're now working on text robots, uh, text um, chatbots, but ultimately it'll be voice, 
So if the invoice comes in, the, uh, the human user will say, oh, okay, robot, if, if you see that type of invoice, stick it in back in A. And the robot will say, okay, I've got that. Uh, I will remember it for the next time. There are lo lots of other examples, but those are, those are some of the examples uh, that, we, that we're working on. Um, and some of them exist now. So, scaling. So how do you use a scale? Um, so customers, I mean, we've got 250 customers, um, and customers that found that to move from pilots to sustainable large-scale automation, they require three, three things, really. First, to get the right people doing the right things in the right way. Um, team building a methodology, basically. So building a center of excellence appears to be the most efficient way of doing that. And it doesn't matter which technology you decide to use, um, Automation the way and Blue Prism and us all advocate the use of a, a central excellence, getting the right people doing the right things at the right time. Secondly, to support business operations with effective change management. So some are actually leveraging their or leveraging their, their existing Lean Six Sigma investments, their, their, their process improvement teams. So General is a good example of that. So General has uh, 306 green and debt belts uh, run by a guy called uh, Paul Rougier. Um, and they are inculcating RPA and teaching RPA to all of those people. So it just becomes a standard tool for their tool set. Uh, and that raises an interesting point, actually. So if you think back to offshoring and outsourcing 15, 20 years ago, there was a choice. You either fixed the process and then outsourced it or offshored it, or you just threw it over the wall and got the outsourcer to do it. It's pretty much the same with RPA. So you can, you can automate your shit process. Um, it's not advisable to do it, but you, you don't need to change the process in order to automate it. Much better to use the center of excellence and your lead six sigma process improvement people, your global process owners, those type of people to fix the process first, because it, it may be that automation isn't the right answer, or you can just eliminate that process entirely. Um, so it's worth doing that first, then you're automating a, a slicker uh, and more efficient process. That appears to be the way that most organizations are going. <coughs> and then capitalizing on early successes in successful sponsorship to increase deployment of scale is also a must. In the same way that outsourcing and offshoring started with the C suites of organizations saying thou shalt outsource or thou shalt offshore unless there's reason why you shouldn't. We are starting to do that within automation as well. Um, and finally, scaling. In order to achieve this, you need to make the transactional people of today into the knowledge workers of tomorrow. That was a quote <coughs> from um, one of the guys that was uh, a uh, presentation. I can't actually remember his name, but it was a great quote, so I, uh, I pinched it. The center of excellence in particular is the key because it ensures that RPA is implemented effectively into the entire enterprise and easily scaling significantly. First, you set up your robotic operating team with clear and well-defined roles for sponsors, champions, change managers, developers, and business analysts. At the same time within CLE, you must focus on the development environment that supports the implementation. Take into consideration the robot's configuration, maintenance, support, security, the performance, and, and, and connectivity. And next, you have to create a sustainable governance model, governance is really important, that includes IT, uh, that determines what processes will be automated and the prioritization for those. Um, so IT, and in fact, it came out time and time again over the last couple of days in, in Dusseldorf at uh, the event, the IQPC event I was at. IT should be involved on day zero. You need to involve IT, even if you're in operations that actually own the robots, IT should be involved right at the start, because otherwise you run into problems. Uh, not in terms of the capability, but in terms of making sure it works within the existing, going the existing IT uh, infrastructure. Um, okay, so we've got another another question that's come in. Um, this one's from Neil Sheffer um, from TCS. Uh, what is NLP? So um, Neil, NLP is, is uh, natural language processing. There's a whole alphabet soup of acronyms: ML, machine learning, and DNN, uh, deep neural networks, and so on. So. Um, natural language processing is just the way that you communicate with uh, technology systems. The, the best examples uh, in terms of voice, certainly, are Siri, Alexa, and IPsoft and uh, Amelia, which uh, is doing some fantastic work in this space. So um, natural language processing is the answer. 
Um, so my final slide, actually, um, is this one. Um, and it's actually, again, nothing to do with RPA. It's all to do with being a successful software business. Um, to be really future-proof, you need two things, um, and only two things. Based on the last 20 years of host software history, you require an open architecture and standards that supports ease of extensibility. In other words, allowing customers and partners in that tripartite relationship, I mentioned, to build their own intellectual property on top of the automation platform. In other words, we want to make it as easy as possible for you to build your own capabilities on top of our platform. And you can do that because it's on .NET. Um, in fact, it's Workflow Foundation. It's the same software that Visio and SharePoint's built on. So it means that you can then build your capabilities, <coughs> uh, excuse me, um, much more effectively and much broader if you've got that open platform. Um, the other technologies are a bit more black box. Um, they still do the work, but you feed the data in, the robot does itself, and you get the data out. Whereas our platform is, is it's not open source, but it's an open platform, so that's important. Um, secondly, you need the community, which I mentioned before. Um, since we launched our community edition, it's free, and our free community edition last year, um, and that's available free of charge forever um, to companies below a million dollars, to individuals, and to uh, not-for-profits, uh, universities, and so on. Um, then um, we launched that last year, and we got, got a group of about 13,000 developers. Um, and in April this year, we launched our UI Path Academy. That's our training academy, <coughs> which is actually a, a massive open online course, um, a MOOC. And we're expecting that number to be 100,000 by the end of this year because RPA okay, is a really hot topic and it's the only online training available free to everybody in the world. Um, uh, and I mean, so far we've got, I think we've had about 4,000 people went through uh, in the first eight weeks uh, across 70 countries. So that will start to help also the, um, the resource constraints. So if, you've got, if you can call on people that are trained up in the technology and then you inculcate them in the way that you work within your organization, uh, then that's going to speed up the process as well. It's what one of our backers described as a growth hack, which I like so much I stole it. Um, but the Academy guarantees that companies implementing or scaling automation solutions will always have access to a large pool of experts and developers specialised in, uh, well, in our technology in this case. Um, so, you know, if you need five people in Helsinki and four in Kazakhstan and six in Chicago, then there's likely to be those people that you can then call on, uh, and we'll, we'll freely um, put you in touch with them, assuming that they're, they're happy to be put in touch with, um, and that will really help the, the stuff. Um, so that's it from me. Um, the um, my contact details. Uh, I'm on uh, Twitter uh, at Guy Kirkwood, and um, I've recently moved, as I said, from from CLO to Chief Evangelist. That is a bi-directional role. So it's not only me doing presentations like this and, uh, and webinars and so on, but it's also gathering information. Now, as I go and speak to our developer community, uh, as I go and speak to customers and partners and analysts and advisors, um, I'm feeding that information back into the organization, into our sales and marketing activities, but also into the development teams, into the support teams, into our customer, uh, customer success teams, so that we can actually iterate more, far, more rapidly and actually produce stuff that you want. So a good example of that was one of our customers uh, was looking for a, um, a QR code reader. Um, it didn't exist, so we just built it. Um, so as you come up against things that you can't do, let us know, guy at uipath.com. You can email me at any time. Uh, and we will, uh, and we will put, start to put together those, those types of solutions for you. Um, we've got another question here from Art Anderson. Um, he said the, uh, the RPA space has got very crowded uh, over the last few years. Um, there's pioneers like you, uh, uh, Automation Halo and Blue Prism, <coughs> the management consultancy firms like Accenture, Deloitte, and many others. What do you suggest in helping companies select a partner for scaling their RPA operations? Uh, that's a really good question, Art. Um, 
and it's it's down to horses for courses, not horses for sources. <coughs> not horses for courses. Um, my recommendation is to go to your existing partner, your existing consulting partner, implementation partner, your existing BPO partner. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, I've got a terrible cold. Um, and and then ask them what they're doing in auto automation. Because it's likely that they might have activities going on inside the organization. I would suggest that you do an independent look at the different technologies, and I would suggest to look at all three. Decide which technology you want to, want to use, and then go to your partner and say, this is the technology we've decided on, what capabilities have you got in that? And that will give you a good indication as to whether they're going to be appropriate. Now, the big guys, the Deloitte, the PwCs, the extensions, and so on, they're scaling up very, very fast. About three years ago, I wrote a little piece saying that, that, um, that the consulting organizations should consider RPA to be the new ERP, and I got laughed at. Um, but that is exactly what we're starting to see. So Deloitte, for instance, just in the UK, are talking about um, training up 5,000 of their people on automation, on UI path, actually, um, this year. That's all of their risk advisory people and all of their consultants, because it's just, they see it's just going to be a standard tool for, uh, for, the, for their consultants, providing services to their customers. I know the PwC are, are looking to, uh, to grow that capability as well, uh, and Accenture certainly are. So Accenture acquired Gen 4, which actually had the most experience of UiPath implementations uh, about a month ago, um, because their customers were asking for, uh, for UiPath capabilities, so they just bought Gen 4, it just makes sense for them to do that. Also look at the smaller organizations, um, because they, they are uh, very agile, they have a lot of deep experience, now, that may be a small group within a big company. So Deloitte in Norway, for instance, have uh, a huge amount of experience. They've done 17, 18 implementations. Um, very good team. Uh, look at Symphony Ventures. Um, they've got a big operational center in, in Krakow. They're spreading around the world. And in fact, they are moving into, um, potentially, into uh, robotic process automation enabled BPA because they can outsource the process but need the people. So, and provide different commercial models because AA and BP and us, we are we all sell license uh, annual subscription licenses. But guys like Symphony are now going to offer different transaction models. Um, and in fact, Capgemini have done something similar uh, with a virtual delivery center. So they took a 3,000 seat center and automated everything. Uh, and uh, in fact, they use UiPath for, for the structured data, um, the RPA, and they actually use Celaton. Uh, British company, very good British company, uh, to do the, the unstructured stuff. That's uh, C-E-L-A-T-O-N, by the way, if you want to look them up, very good. Um, and uh, so in terms of partners, uh, Art, um, find out who you are working for, working with at the moment, ask what their capabilities are once you've decided which technology, and then you can make a rational decision as to who you prefer. Um, or you could ask us. I mean, you know, there are, there are organisations that we work with um, more, and there are organisations that say people can work with um, more. So they work much more with, uh, with EY, uh, and, uh, for instance. And AA have their partners. Although AA, their um, automation are looking to IPO next year. They're looking to do many more implementations themselves. So they get the service uh, part of the uh, revenue as well. It's not something that we do, but it's something that I do. So that that probably answers answers the question. Um, another question has come in, uh, in fact, a very good question. Uh, will AI replace RPA? Um, the answer is no. <laughs> um, if you think that uh, Tom Luna from HFS has been talking a lot about this, um, he considers it a continuum. So you go from RPA to cognitive to AI. <coughs> but actually, I, I, I don't think that that's the case. Um, and the best analogy I came up with is a golfing one. So um, if you're standing on the tee and you've got 400 yards to get down the fairway over the bunkers onto the green and into the hole, um, you can't have one club to do that. What you need is a combination. So think about RPA as, as the driver. Um, it will get you off the tee and down the fairway as far as you can. Think about the cognitive tools as an iron that will get you over the bunker and onto the green. And think about the AI tools as a putter. Then we'll get you across the grid and into the bowl, uh, into, into the hole. Um, actually, what we're doing in terms of the combining those 
those uh, tools that are being democratized and open sourced by the Microsoft and the Googles and the IBMs is that we are basically baking those into our into our proposition, into our platform. So <coughs> Daniel Dinez, our, our chief executive founder, is focused on the on the core product, the core platform. Then we've got Boris Krumry, who's who's focused on the extensions to that. So it's the uh, where the AI and cognitive tools fit into that. Uh, and then we've got uh, 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 Venu, who's working on the solutions that surround that as well. So it's like an onion. Um, but in terms of the AI and cognitive tools, as they become baked in, uh, we're not going to create a, a super club because that doesn't make any sense. But basically what we're doing is building a drone. Um, that will pick the ball up from the tee, fly it down the fairway, and drop it straight in the hole. I know it's not sport anymore. That's not golf. It breaks a golfing analogy. But that's essentially what we're doing. And that, and that is the most efficient way that we can see of doing it. Um, I noticed that we're, uh, we're coming up to about 50 minutes. A um, couple more questions are coming. Um, how do you automate front office activities when the business case is so different from the back office? So uh, that's a really good question as well. So we, we don't talk about front office and back office now. We talk about attended and unattended because, because there are some unattended tasks that take place in the front office. But essentially, um, the business case for unattended is you are replacing manual labor. As I said, you don't, that doesn't mean that you're making those people redundant. You're just moving them up the value chain. You're allowing them to do more uh, work, uh, different work, and higher value work. But the business case for for back office or, or unattended activities is all about replacing that money or labor. So you're replacing the FTEs, the full-time equivalents of work. The business case for attended front office operations is all about augmentation. You are helping the agent talking to the customer or citizen if you're a public sector organization um, be more efficient when you're talking. So we always recommend that you automate your unattended back office operations first because otherwise you end up with a, with a bigger backlog. But if you then automate the front office with the attended activities, um, then you actually end up with a double delta. So you increase the efficiency and decrease the cost of the, of the back office operation. Um, and by automating front office, which is a cost, it's an investment, because you're not replacing that human labor, you can actually produce much better results, both in terms of customer experience and in terms of the ability to on-sell and upsell. So let me give you an example. With an insurance company, um, let's say someone calls in and they've got several different products from the insurance uh, business, but they're calling up about pet insurance. Um, by the time they've gone to security, the robot will have picked up all of the information from all of the disparate different systems that are in the insurance organization on that individual, uh, which is also why it helps with the compliance and governance, which I mentioned before. But actually, um, when you use, what the user sees when they're talking to the customer is a single version of the truth. That all of the activity that that individual has had with the insurance company, all of the products that they've bought, all of their claims history, and so on, all from the multiple different systems. So that allows them to have a much, much better conversation, unscripted, unscripted conversation with the customer, which massively improves customer experience. So it means that they don't have to hand off to different departments if they then want to find out something about their household insurance or their car insurance or whatever it might be. By doing that, automating that activity, um, both before the call and afterwards, promulgating that information back into the multiple different systems, then it means that you can on-sell and up-sell much more effectively. So that's where you get an increase in revenue, that hits the double delta, along with the back office operations. So that's a really good question. Uh, final question is, in what geographies are you seeing the highest levels of adoption for RPA? Um, again, that's, a, that's an excellent, uh, excellent question. Um, Europe is still ahead. Europe is, uh, is still um, automating more than any other geography. Um, and I think that's probably the case. Blue Prism, uh, a European, uh, Nice, who, who started uh, in automation fairly early on, uh, based in, uh, they did a lot of work in, the, in Europe, uh, based in um, Tel Aviv, in uh, Israel actually. And, and then we were based, uh, we are, are based in Europe as well. Um, automation anyways, was much more focused on the US market. Now the US market is accelerating very fast indeed. Um, so, and the reason for that is they're not bothering with the PSEs. They're going straight to pilots and they're scaling up. So 
our biggest customer has changed six times in the last six weeks. Um, and it's gone from an oil company to a insurance company to a bank to a retailer and now to a manufacturing organization. So it cuts across all industries. Three of those five are actually US. So last year, 40% of our revenues came from the US and we didn't have any people there. Um, now we have, um, I'm expecting US to overtake Europe um, by the end of Q3 this year. And more generally, I think in the market, the US is going to overtake Europe um, by the end of this year. Um, the other areas we're seeing big growth is in those areas that didn't tend to outsource an offshore. So it's the Nordics, it's uh, Japan, it's Australia. Uh, we've got operations in, in, in certainly in Tokyo and, and Melbourne uh, recently. Um, and the reason for that is that those organizations didn't tend to outsource an offshore and they see automation, they see RPA as the way to leapfrog over those, that whole labor arbitrage stuff. Um, which sort of sums up where we are with, with the end of this, this um, topic, actually. Because if you look at um, ultimately what's going to happen, I think that as organizations increasingly see the value of and the rapid ROIs, ROIs afforded by automation, as you've heard not only from what I've said, but also from the previous sessions um, that you've had over, the, over this week, I think that outsourcing will cease to be the main way that they handle their internal operations. Um, and I think this burden will be picked up by RPA and intelligent automation. So if you have any questions, uh, if you any further questions, or if you want to find out more, um, please do uh, follow me on Twitter and, uh, and also drop me an email. I will put you in touch with the team. Um, uh, I hope you've enjoyed the whole week. And... Um, I look forward to uh, talking to you. As mentioned, um, there is a white paper that's going to come out to you um, as well as the recording of this, uh, of this um, webinar. Um, and uh, I look forward, to, and the team look forward to uh, speaking to you all. But in the meantime, have a very lovely weekend. Thank you very much, and goodbye.